Hello, I am Shai Halevi. I'm going to talk about can a blockchain keep a secret? And this is joint work with Fabrice Minamuda, Craig Gentry, Sergei Garbuno, Hugo Kravchik, Cheng Yu Lin, Tal Rabin, and Leonie Fresen. The type of blockchains that we're interested in in this work are public proof of stake blockchain. Uh, so public uh, proof of stake blockchain uh, for us is just a network of distributed uh, a distributed network of many nodes. Let's call the number of nodes B N. Each node has some number of coins that we call the stake of that node, and everybody knows how many coins everybody else has. So that's not a secret. Decisions in this network are obtained by majority vote, and every node has as many votes as its stake, as the number of coins that it has. And decisions are published in blocks, they're visible for everybody to see, so the, no the network needs to decide, for example, if a particular transaction is going to go through, the nodes will vote on it, if they approve that transaction, uh, the transaction will be included in the next block and would be published on the blockchain. So this is the blockchain. The interesting properties for blockchain is the scalability of them. Uh, we are aiming at a large network with many nodes in it. And as more nodes join the systems, uh, holding the votes starts becoming expensive. This is known as the consensus problem in distributed systems. Uh, it's a well-researched uh, problem. Uh, there are many solutions to it, but those solutions are expensive and we want these decisions to happen rapidly. Uh, I'm interested in a particular type of solutions that are used in the Algorand network, which is based on uh, choosing a small random committee to represent the entire system. We're gonna have a different random committee for every block. We're gonna choose a random committee and that random committee will make the decision on behalf of the entire network. The thought here is that if a large majority of the entire population is honest and follow the protocol appropriately, then with high probability, the random committee that we choose is also going to have a large honest majority. And therefore, a vote of the random committee is a well representation of a vote of the entire system. The tool that we are using to choose these random committee is cryptographic sortition. And let me spend a few minutes talking about how to do that. So uh, cryptographic sortition allows every node to generate a pseudo random number in such a way that nobody can guess this number ahead of time. But after the fact, the node can prove the results to everyone without being able to cheat about it. So I'm going to choose a random number. Nobody knows what number I'm going to choose, but there's only one number that I can choose. There's only one number that I can convince everybody is the right number that I was supposed to choose in this, uh, um, in this sort of random manner. And the way to think about it is as a hash of a signature of a public value. So I'm going to be using a particular type of signatures that has this property that every public value, there's only a single signature uh, that is valid with respect to that public key and that public value. And, it, and then I'm going to hash the signature and this is going to be my random number. So now I can prove to everybody that this is the random number, but just giving them the signature because uh, they can check that it's a valid signature. They know that there's only one valid signature for that public value because this is a property of the scheme that I'm using. And they can check that uh, a hash of this signature is indeed this random number that I set. So this is a way for me to choose something which is on one hand random and on the other hand verifiable. I'm going to use this to select committee. So every node in our system will choose this random number the way we described it. And if I'm a node with some stake S and my number was R, I'm going to be in the committee. For example, if R is less than a thousand times my stake divided by the total stake. So if you use this way to select a committee, then you expect about a thousand parties or more like more, more accurately parties represent 1,000 coins, you expect them to end up at the committee. And since everybody knows my stake, then once I broadcast a proof 
for my random number, everybody can check that it is indeed small enough relative to my stake, and therefore I am indeed on the committee. So this is a way for me to self-select myself to the committee and prove to everybody else that indeed I am supposed to be on the committee. With that uh, explained, the thing that we want to do, the thing that we want to get out of the blockchain is we want to use the blockchain as a complete computing platform. And in this work, when we say computing platform, what we really mean is a trusted party. So in this picture, the elephant is the blockchain and all the other animals have something that they want to compute. So they all give their inputs to the blockchain. The blockchain can compute on it, get the output for to them, uh, without revealing anything about the input values. So it behaves as, as a trusted party for the purpose of computing this thing that they want to compute. This is what we want our blockchain to be. And the question is, can we really use public proof of stake blockchain in this manner? And today the answer is not really. Blockchains are great if what you care about is integrity or immutability of the result. Uh, there is a large system, they are all computing, the decision made by consensus, so we have agreement, we have immutability. Secrecy is a lot harder. The blockchain is public, everybody sees what's going on here. How would I send an input to a computation if I care about the secret of that computation? So in this work, we focus specifically about secrecy and we're looking at a very, very basic setting. We have a setting where a client has a secret. It's all it wants is to deposit that secret with the blockchain and have it revealed only when the time is right or more generally used only in the prescribed manner. For example, I'm going to publish a puzzle. I'm going to deposit the solution at the blockchain and I'm going to tell the blockchain to reveal the solution if nobody found it by next week. So the committee that does something on behalf of the blockchain will have the capability of recovering that secret. And if the conditions are met, the committee would actually recover the secret and publish it. And otherwise it will remain a secret. This is a very, very basic functionality. And if we can get that, it form, can form the basis of many interesting and very, very powerful applications. The goals that we have in this work are security and efficiency. Security is fairly obvious. The secret must remain a secret. By that, we mean that if there is an attacker here, the attacker should not be able to, rec to recover the secret as long as the blockchain thinks that it should stay a secret. Uh, of course, the blockchain could sti still has the ability to recover the secret uh, so that when the time is right, they will be able to publish it. Now, when we say that, uh, we have to make an assumption that the adversary does not control the network, the blockchain. And in particular, we assume honest majority or a large honest majority of the stake of the blockchain. One very important point when we say that is we assume that the adversary is mobile. So it is true that at any given point in time, the adversary only control a small minority of the stake but it can control this node today, maybe this other node tomorrow, then this other node recovers and is no longer controlled by the adversary, but the adversary moves on to a third node, et cetera, et cetera. So under this type of attack model, we want to ensure that the secret remains secret. In terms of efficiency, the thing that we're after is a scalable solution. And by that, I mean specifically that the complexity of the solution does not increase as there are more blocks in the blockchain or as there are more nodes in the blockchain, the time that it takes the committee to do the work in order to maintain that secret, that time is some fixed polynomial in the security parameter independent of the number of nodes, total number of nodes in the system or the, number, the length of the history or things like that. Another uh, requirement that we have that I call plausible practicality is that we can hope to make it efficient. Now, this is still a theoretical work. We did not try to implement it, but we want to choose our tools in such a way that there's at least a hope that we can implement it efficiently. Well, what that means is that we should not be using super heavy tools such as obfuscation or witness encryption. It's not very hard to come up with a solution based on obfuscation or witness encryption, but we do not want to use a solution like that because there is no way that we can implement obfuscation. Uh, we do not have constructions that are implementable. Instead, 
Uh, in this work, we're looking at solutions that are based on proactive secret sharing. So let me spend a few minutes talking about what secret sharing and proactive secret sharing is. Let's start with Shamir secret sharing. The setting here is I have a secret S. I have, there are N parties. I want to share my secret among these N parties in such a way that every majority of them, more than N over two, can recover the secret but every subset of n over two or less has no information about my secret. And the way to do that is I'm going to choose a random polynomial of degree n over two in such a way that the free term of that polynomial is the secret over some finite field. And then each part is party one, two, three, up to n. I'm going to give party i the evaluation of my polynomial at the point i. And if I do that, then every subset of more than n over two parties can recover the entire polynomial just by interpolation and therefore find the free term. But subsets with less than n over two party, the only thing they see are just random and independent uniform shares independent of my secret. Proactive secret sharing is an area that started with Ostrowski and Jung almost 30 years ago, uh, and it wants to look at specifically this mobile adversary that I mentioned before. So the adversary can compromise many parties over time. Eventually, it can have a majority of the parties, but at any point in time, it only uh, compromises very few. So I want to be able to keep a secret shared in this manner, even though the adversary is mobile and over time can reach any one of my, my nodes. And the way to do that is I periodically refresh the polynomial without changing the secret. So I have one polynomial today, another one tomorrow, yet another one the next day, etc. All of these polynomials have degree n over 2. All of them have the same free terms. So f1 of 0 and f2 of 0 and f3 of 0 are all equal to my secret, but they're individually random other than these conditions. And then every day, let's say, I will run uh, a share refresh protocol where I'm going to refresh the form of the polynomial. So if the committee one uh, had shares according to polynomial F1, committee two will have shares of according to polynomial F2, etc. And then the secret will remain secret as long as we have honest majority in each epoch separately, or each committee separately, even if different parties are compromised in different times. Because the adversary, uh, you know, finding uh, f1 of 1 and f2 of 3 and f3 of 17 doesn't help. You need to find uh, more than n over 2 shares of one polynomial if you want to use the interpolation. And the crux, the problem with this, the thing that you need to solve is how to do that. How does committee C1 compute and send the new shares to committee C2? even without knowing who is currently compromised, because nobody knows who's currently compromised. So there was a lot of work in, in this, especially in the 90s, and a lot of solutions. But using this proactive secret sharing approach on a public blockchain is actually harder than it is uh, in normal circumstances. And the reason is this. Let's assume that the adversary can compromise a small fraction, let's say 20% of the entire stake, but not more. And I said that for scalability, communication and computation is only done by a small committee, right? I mean, this is what we do. We choose a small random committee and they do everything on behalf of the blockchain. But the committee is small. In fact, it's much, much smaller than an F fraction of the stake. So a mobile adversary that has a budget to corrupt 20% of everybody, if it knows who the committee is, it can just go and corrupt them all. And then it knows the secret. There has been work on proactive secret sharing on blockchain over the last couple of years. Nobody actually addressed that issue. They, all that work was focused on various issues of efficiency, but they just assumed that magically all these small committees have honest majority in it. Our work is the first time where we actually devise a mechanism to ensure that the committees still have honest majority, even though the corruption budget of the adversary is a lot bigger than the size of each individual committee. And the way to do that is by keeping the committee anonymous. We use what, again, I call the algorithm approach here of player replaceability, and that means that each committee member 
uh, only needs to send a single message revealing its identity only after completing its job. So if I'm on the committee, I do my things. Nobody knows that I'm on a committee yet. I do my things, I compute whatever message that I want to compute, then I broadcast that message and I'm no longer on the committee. So by the time the adversary learned that I was on the committee, there is no point in compromising me anymore because I am no longer on the committee. So the adversary cannot uh, specially target the committee for corruptions. And that works very well with cryptographic sortition. If the committee self-selects, so I self-select, I computed my R value that I talked about. I have my proof that I belong to the committee. I'm computing the message that I'm going to be sending. I'm attaching this proof to the message. I'm broadcasting everything and everybody can check and say, yes, really I needed to be on the committee and therefore I can take my message and my votes and use them. So that works very well. But how would it work with secret sharing? In secret sharing, we have this extra comp uh, component of a secret. If I'm on the committee, I'm supposed to have some share of the secret. How am I going to get it if nobody knows that I'm on the committee? How do you share and reshare a secret with an unknown committee? Before I tell you about how we do that, let me describe to you how some things that we thought about and don't actually work. So the first natural thing is maybe the secret sharing committee can self-select. But as I said, that doesn't really work because the old committee doesn't know uh, who is on the new committee, so they don't know who to pass the secret. Here's another natural idea. How about each committee member selects its successor? I'm on the committee. Now I'm going to select somebody on the next committee, and then I'm going to... Uh, I'm not sure what happened. Can we renew the uh, the video stream, or should I do it uh, live? Uh, Sean, do you know, uh, are we still live streaming? Hello? The solution itself take you to a dream world for a second and tell you, wouldn't it be great if we had the following communication uh, tool that I called a target anonymous channel. The target anonymous channel is just a communication channel, like a broadcast channel, but has the following properties. It has n visible input ports, lil n visible input port, lil n hidden output ports. Anybody can send messages on the IF input port and it will be routed somewhere. There are going to be a random assignment of the output ports to some lil n subset of the big n users. So anyone can say in the, on the IF input port, not knowing who will receive the message. And in particular, in our context, the current committee can reshare the secret using those n, little n input ports. And the shares will be sent to the new random committee. So that would be very nice. It doesn't actually solve all of our problems. There's still work to do, even if we had that uh, communication, type of communication channel, but uh, it helps that. So next I'm going to show you how to implement that communication infrastructure. And the tools for that I'm going to use for that <clears throat> is cryptographic sortition that I already described, public key and a broadcast channel, both of them provided by the blockchain itself, right? I mean, if I have a blockchain, I can post things in the blockchain and serve as a block, uh, broadcast channel, and I can post my public key on the blockchain, and then everybody knows my public key, so I have a PKI. And another thing that we use is anonymous public key encryption. Uh, so let me spend some time talking about that. This is just a normal public key encryption scheme. Well, there's a public key and a secret key. I can encrypt it with public key. I can decrypt with this secret key, etc. But it has this extra property that if I have two public keys and I a ciphertext encrypted under one of them, I cannot tell whether it was encrypted under the first public key or the second public key. So this I'm going to be using in order to establish these target anonymous channels, right? I'm going to have public keys. Many of them you can encrypt under one of them, but nobody, once you have the ciphertext, nobody knows uh, who it was sent to. How, with these tools, I'm going to approximate these target anonymous channels that we talked about. 
And the way we're going to do that is by introducing yet another type of committee. This is not the committee that will be secret sharing. I'm calling it the nominating committee because its job is to nominate the secret sharing committee. So this, the nominating committee doesn't know any secrets and it can self-select. There's no problem of anybody needing to pass anything to them. So it self-selects using the cryptographic sortition of the way I described before. And then each nominator on the nominated committee, PI, what it does is it chooses one of the other members and it constructs a target anonymous channel leading to that member. So it chooses a random nominee PJ from the end parties. It draws an ephemeral public and secret key pairs. It publishes the public, the new ephemeral public key, and it encrypts the new ephemeral secret key under the long-term key of the nominee. And for that encryption, we use anonymous public encryption. So the ciphertext holding the key of this new channel that I just established, that ciphertext in as anonymous. I broadcast it, everybody can see it. Nobody knows who it belongs to, except of course the member uh, that can decrypt this. There is one member, specifically PJ, that can decrypt this ciphertext and recover the secret key. Everybody can use the ephemeral public key. This is my input port. Uh, only one member can decrypt it. So only that member knows that this uh, channel leads to it. What happens when the nominator is at the If the nominator is corrupted, they can always nominate their corrupted friends. And you can think that, oh, maybe we can force them to nominate properly because uh, we can ask them to prove that they did something properly. Well, that doesn't work here. Because think of a corrupted nomina nominator. It knows who it chose. So even if it's forced to, uh, to go through a particular process in choosing that nominator, let's say using sortition or whatnot, at the end of the day, I know who my successor is. I can just turn around and corrupt that successor if it happened to be honest. So either way, even if the corrupted nominators would have to prove things, they would always be able to make sure that their successors are also corrupted. So it doesn't help me to try to uh, have them prove anything. Moreover, if I wanted them to prove something, it would be hard because those proofs would have long statement. And by that, I mean the statement of I did things correctly is I took one of these big N keys and I established a channel to that key. Well, that statement has size that depends on the size of the entire blockchain, a big N. So it's going, the producing the proof is not going to be scalable. Of course, we can use snarks, in which case the proofs and shelf are short, but again, snarks are relatively expensive and I prefer not to use them. And in any case, those proofs won't help us. So adversarial nominators will be able to nominate corrupted uh, uh, parties. There's nothing that we can do about it in this solution. That has consequences. And the consequences is the resilience of our solution is slightly lower because the adversary gets a double dipping strategy. Imagine that the adversary controls F fraction of the parties, then it controls roughly F fraction of the nominators, right? The nominating committee self-selects and therefore represents the entire population. The corrupted nominators choose corrupted nominees. Honest nominator choose random nominees. So with probability F, they choose corrupted nominees. So the chosen committee will have roughly two F fraction of corruptions. Um, what that means is if we want to ensure honest majority of, in the selected committee, we have to assume that F, the fraction that the adversary controls, is less than one quarter. Here is the structure of the overall solutions. We have these nominating committees that self-selects. Each nominating committee selects a secret sharing committee. And once the nominated committee selects tomorrow's secret sharing committee, today's secret sharing committee can use those target anonymous channels to pass the share on to the new committee. That's the way it works. Uh, it's important to, to point out that 
we do not have here the problem of more and more and more corrupted parties as time goes by because the nominating committee self-selects. So each nominating committee selects from scratch, uses the cryptographic sortition, so it will have roughly an F fraction of corrupted parties no matter what happened before. So we don't have this problem, but we do have double, double dipping. So the amount of corruptions in the secret sharing committee can be as high as 2F instead of F. I still need to tell you how the secret sharing committee is going to reshare the secret, and that's done essentially a fairly um, uh, standard way. There are some more problems here than usual because of our player replaceability property where every member just sends a single message and that's it. So that's a challenge that typically proactive secret chain doesn't have and we need to describe a protocol that works in this model. But again, the protocol is fairly standard. The current committee has a secret chain of the secret S, which means that there is this polynomial big F with free term equal to S, where each member I of the current committee has a share, which is the evaluation of F at point I. Each uh, shareholder secret shares its own share. So I take my SI and I do secret sharing of it. And these shares of shares are going to be sent over the anonymous channels. So I'm going to be choosing FI of X, I'm the ith member, which is a random polynomial of degree on over two with the free term equal to my share. So FI of zero equals SI. And then I'm going to send on the JS channel the evaluation of my polynomial at the point J. And I'm going to, in addition, broadcast a proof that resharing was done correctly. The future committee member J gets on its channel the evaluation at point J of many FIs, all the AIs. It takes T of them and interpolates the share from T, which is N, N over 2 plus 1 of them. And it interpolates the share from those uh, T shares of shares. Importantly, all the honest future committee members are going to interpolate their share from the same T members of the old committee. And the way this is done is you take all of these shares that arrived with the proofs that they were done correctly. You take all the ones where the proof uh, pass, and you just take the first T of them. So since all the proofs, proofs are broadcast, it means that all the honest parties see the entire proofs. It means that they will agree on which set has passed. It means that they will agree on which T of them they're going to be using for their interpolation. How do you prove correct resharing? Important aspect of this protocol is all the messages are sent here via broadcast. So I'm broadcasting a ciphertext that only the recipient can decrypt. This is how this is how these channels were established, right? A channel is represented by a public key. The same ciphertext also serves as commitment to the value that was set. So if I'm a node in the current committee and I need to prove that I reshared correctly, what everybody knows because it was in the pub in the broadcast channel are all the ciphertexts that were sent to me and all the ciphertexts that I'm sending forward. So I have these two sets of ciphertexts and essentially what I need to show is that the values on these ciphertexts lie on some low degree polynomial. This is the, what I need to prove. This is a proof of uh, membership in a linear subspace. These are typically easy proofs. And moreover, importantly, all the statements and the witnesses are short. The thing that I prove are about vectors of ciphertext whose size is the size of the committee, independent of how many parties there are in the system overall. So that makes the proof short. We do not necessarily need to use snarks. We can use normal non-interactive zero knowledge, and that could be a lot faster, especially if you use feature. How do you interpolate the shares? Well, actually, I don't have time, and this is not particularly interesting. It's completely standard. Uh, what I do is I'm taking my all the shares that I got, I'm taking the Lagrange coefficients, and I'm going to take a linear combination, and that's going to be my share. It's not uh, very important. I'm going to skip it. The end result of this 
is that we have a scalable proactive secret sharing protocol with this player replaceability property. So the committee that has the shares and the nominating committee for that matter, each member of them just sends a single message. They do not need to keep state from one, one uh, round to the next, except of course their secret keys. In terms of resilience, the, we need to assume that the adversary controls less than one quarter of the stake, so there's definitely room for improvement here. In terms of the assumptions that we need, you can implement it from basically all the public key assumptions that we know and love, uh, DDH, uh, uh, DCR, uh, learning with errors, whatever you want. One point about it is that our solution requires to use this anonymous encryption scheme. And as I will say in, in the next couple of slides, is we need anonymous encryption to remain anonymous also under selective opening attack. And there is an open problem here that I will talk about next, uh, which is interesting and I think is worth thinking about. And the last thing about our end result is that it can conceivably be made practical. So again, it's just a theoretical result. We do not have a practical implementation of it, but the tools that we use are standard enough to believe that it is uh, plausible that you can make it fast, really. So for the last part of this talk, let me spend a few minutes talking about anonymous public key encryption under selective opening. In our solution, we have these ciphertexts that we broadcast. And these ciphertexts were encrypted under some anonymous public key encryption. And the adversary sees these public keys and it sees these ciphertexts. And only then it can decide which of the public keys, it, each of the members it wants to corrupt, so which of the public keys it needs to uh, open. And that brings up the questions, can an adversary that only corrupts an F fraction of the keys nonetheless manage to read a lot more than an F fraction of the ciphertext. So in our setting, we have N public keys, big N public keys, a lot of keys. Little M ciphertext, a lot less ciphertext than public keys. And which key was used to encrypt what ciphertext is computationally hidden. Nonetheless, is it possible for an adaptive adversary uh, that corrupts less than F times N keys to somehow magically hit a lot more than F times M of the blue keys, the keys that were actually used to encrypt ciphertext, even though they are computational. That's a question, <clears throat> whether we can prove that something like that doesn't happen. Um, it's, um, the model is the selective opening model, which is a model that has been looked at a lot in the context of secrecy. We have an adaptive adversary, it sees keys, it sees ciphertext, and then it opens the keys one at a time. That's an adaptive adversary. You can also talk about a semi-adaptive adversary. It's the same thing except the uh, semi-adaptive adversary first sees all the keys in the ciphertext, and then in one shot it decides the subset of the keys that it wants to corrupt instead of doing them one at a time. Uh, both of those have been looked at in the literature in the context of secrecy, it is known that semantic security does not imply necessarily secrecy, secrecy under selective opening. So, and this is true even for semi-adaptive adversaries. There are semantically secure public key encryption schemes such that if you let the adversary see ciphertext and keys and then choose which keys it wants to open, uh, it can violate secrecy. We ask the same question about anonymity, and it turns out that in the case of anonymity, things are better than in the case of secrecy. At least for semi-adaptive adversaries, we are able to show that if you open at most a fraction of the keys, then there is no way for you to open many more than a fraction of the ciphertext and cryptic keys, the keys that actually matter, except with negligible probability. And that thing, so, that says that at least for semi-adaptive adversary, uh, regular pub anonymity implies also anonymity under selective opening. We conjecture that the same holds also for fully adaptive adversary. We even have a reduction that we think show it, but uh, the combinatorics of the reduction is just too complicated for us to handle. So we do not have a proof of that. 
Uh, but this is our conjecture, our conjecture that it's the same holds also for fully adaptive adversary, and it would be interesting to uh, prove. Okay, with this, I think I said all I wanted to say. Let me conclude by talking a little bit about open problems and future work. So obvious open problem is the open problem which is stated of proving this conjecture about anonymous public key encryption under selective opening. So we want to prove that an anonymous public key encryption remains anonymous even under selective opening attack. There is a lot of work in trying to improve the solution. Uh, and some of it we're actually working on right now. Uh, one obvious thing that you want to do, uh, and I alluded to it at the very beginning of the talk, we want to use the blockchain as a trusted party, which means we want the blockchain to be able to compute on the secret, not just keep them. Many of these little animals will give us their secret uh, inputs. The blockchain will keep all of these inputs, will compute on it some function, and then will come up with the solution, with the answer, with the uh, output of that function, and publish that without revealing anything about the inputs. So we want to compute on it on the secret rather than just keeping it. We also want to improve the resilience of this target anonymous channel. So if we can get something uh, up to a half instead of up to a quarter, it would be much, much better. It would also make it much more practical because right now we, if you know, depending what we assume on the adversary, but if we assume that the adversary can control 20% of the uh, blockchain and our um, solution only works up to a quarter, then we have only, only these 5% uh, merging of error and we need very large committees so that chain, uh, the chain of uh, boundaries start working with this, this small one error. If we can get it up to a half, then we have a lot more room and we can get by with much smaller committees. And of course, we want to keep everything scalable. So we still want the communication and the computation to, to some extent to depends only on the uh, size of the committee as opposed to the size of the entire network. And the last future work uh, aspect that, of course, is needed is to implement the solution. We didn't try yet. We're still working on trying to improve it. Once we have a, a protocol that we're happy with, uh, we will try to uh, implement it and hopefully even deploy it in some blockchains because it is a very, very powerful thing. Right? It's a decentralized system. It runs. You only assume it has honest majority there, or it already is as a system that exists in the real world. And you can already trust that it's secure in the sense of uh, honest majority because it's so dis decentralized. So if you can then deploy uh, arbitrary functions on it, that's an extremely powerful thing. You no longer need to trust Amazon with your computation. You can give it to a blockchain. It will do the same computation. And that's it. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope that uh, we'll learn something. Thank you, Shai. That's a very deep talk. <laughs> very thank exciting, you. very interesting result. So we thank are uh, at the uh, Q&A session. And first, we got some questions from the uh, live streaming from Bilibili. Uh, the first question is, uh, if f is larger than a quarter, uh, what kinds of attacks can the adversary make under this method? So for our solution specifically, where the adversary has this double dipping strategy, the adversary would control about a quarter of, or a little more than a quarter, let's say, of the nominating committee then all the parties that the adversary control in the nominating committee will nominate corrupted or adversarially controlled members to the secret sharing committee. The honest people on the nominating committee will choose their nominee at random. So again, about a quarter of those will also be corrupted. The end result is that the secret sharing committee, the committee that actually holds the share, will have more than a half of parties that are controlled by the adversary. And at that point, the adversary can just interpolate and find the, find the secret. So secrecy will be completely broken uh, under this system if the adversary can control uh, more than a quarter 
of the uh, parties, of course, provided that the adversary can always corrupt at anybody that it wants to. But um, the R attack model doesn't give any uh, restrictions on the adversary. It has some budget. It cannot corrupt more than, let's say, 20 or 25 percent of the uh, uh, stake. But once it, if it still has some corruption budget and it wants to corrupt a certain node, there is nothing in our model that stops it. It immediately just points to that node and that node becomes corrupted and start cooperating with the adversary. So under this attack model, anything more than a quarter or even just a quarter uh, is lethal for, the, uh, for that solution. It would break it and the adversary would learn the secret. Thanks. That is actually related to one question uh, I have myself. Uh, you mentioned at the end about the open problem, one of them is to improve uh, F. Uh, do you think there might be some upper bound on how big F can be? So actually we do have a solution by now that uh, we're still working on it, but we know how to get F to essentially anything smaller than a half. So if f is any constant smaller than a half, then there exists a solution. Uh, of course, the size of the committee depends on how much smaller f is than a half. Is, is a half. But you know, if you want to tolerate, let's say, f equals you know, 35%, then you'll probably get committees of a size of a few hundreds or something like that. I mean, I, we didn't go through the, this exercise because we don't have the solution complete yet, but uh, there is no problem. I mean, half is sort of an upper bound. I mean, clearly if the adversary controls the majority of the, of the uh, blockchain, then you can't do anything and anything strictly less than a half we can handle. Very interesting. So basically it can get arbitrarily close to a half. Yes. Nice. Another question also from uh, Bilibili is that uh, if a few uh, members of the old sharing committee break down or lose a connection, uh, can we still process a secret resharing without losing resilience? So again, the thing that we need is that there would be, you know, more than N over two, little N over two members, honest members of the old committee that can send their messages to more than n over two members of the new committee as long as so you need to have this if you think about it as a sort of a bipartite clique of between the old committee and the the new committee consisting of n over two members of the old n over two plus one members of the old committee and n over two plus one members of the new committee that all can talk to each other which essentially means all of the old committee can broadcast and every all of these n plus n over two plus one of the old committee can broadcast and everybody among this n plus two over one of the new committee can read the broad broadcast. Uh, and if you have that, that's enough for the protocol to go through. See. Thanks. Uh, uh, another question from the audience, uh, uh, more generic. Uh, what is the difference of uh, anonymity, uh, anonymity and uh, secrecy? Uh, in the context of cryptography in blockchain? So this is a, a generic prob a question about uh, public key encryption. Secrecy meaning the adversary cannot read what's encrypted inside of the message. Anonymity means the adversary doesn't know which public key was used to encrypt that ciphertext. These are two essentially orthogonal um, uh, properties of a public key encryption. Uh, you can have a public key encryption that's secret, but once you see the public keys, it's immediately clear which public key was used to encrypt the ciphertext. Most public key encryption schemes are like that. They're secret, but not anonymous. You can that has both properties. It's both hides the, the message and also hide which public key was used to encrypt that message. Thanks. Uh, from the same audience, uh, how can the original committee members link to the anonymous channels as these channels are actually formed by the nominating committee? So the nominating committee will broadcast their choices. If I'm a nominator, if I'm on the nominating committee, I'm going to choose this ephemeral public and secret key. I'm going to encrypt this secret key anonymously under the long-term key of one of the members of the, of the system. And now I have this package consisting of a new public key 
and an encryption, an anonymous encryption of the corresponding security, I'm going to take this package and I'm going to broadcast it. Now, everybody can see this broadcast, but only the member whose public key I used for the encryption will be able to decrypt it. So me, as just a member of the system, I'm going to see all these broadcast messages and I'm going to try to use my secret key to decrypt each one of them. And if any of them was meant for me, I would be able to decrypt it. And otherwise, I, not only I will not be able to decrypt it, I also don't know who it was meant to, to be to sent to. And now everybody sees the public key. You can think of that ephemeral public key as the input port to the anonymous channel. Everybody can use this ephemeral public key to encrypt messages under it and then broadcast the encryption. I'm going to sit there and since I know the secret key, I can decrypt it and nobody else knows who it was meant for. So I don't, nobody else uh, can, can do anything with it. Makes sense. Uh, one question uh, from, from myself. Uh, you mentioned about computing on the secret at the end. Um, uh, how related is that to uh, homomorphic encryption, do you think? In this case, we will use uh, techniques from secure multi-party computation because this is sort of a um, computation that's done by a committee and we assume that the committee is mostly honest and it has an honest majority. So we will use techniques of uh, secure multi-party computation. That said, some of these techniques might involve uh, use of a homomorphic encryption scheme for computing something or the other as an intermediate step in the big computation. And in fact, some of the more advanced solution that we're thinking about has this flavor that, um, you know, there is some work that's done on, uh, homomorphically. Everybody can compute it because it's homomorphic encryption and you can compute on ciphertext and only the decryption at the end, the committee will do. So there, you can definitely play these games. But by and large, the thing that we're doing is we're doing a, a secure multi-party computation with honest majority among the committee. I see. I see. Thanks. Uh, one more question from the audience, uh, a long question. Uh, how can we make sure that the nominating committee members do not cheat on selecting the new committee? Or do the nominators need to present some proof on they didn't cheat? Right, so this is, uh, I think this was part the part that was sort of uh, partly swollen by the fact that we missed a few sentences in the middle. Uh, nominators in this particular solution can cheat. If the nominator is dishonest, they are able to do whatever they want. We assume that a vast majority of them are, uh, I, maybe I'm forced to choose an honest um, um, secret sharing committee member, but since I'm dishonest, I'm controlled by the adversary. It means that the adversary knows who that member is that I chose. So the adversary can corrupt it after I chose it. So what's the point of me trying to prove that it was honest to begin with? Uh, after the fact, the adversary can always corrupt it. So proofs in our particular solution just don't help and therefore we do not use them. Right, I think that is actually related to the next question from the audience. Is it necessary for the proof in the resharing protocol? Because as far as I know, there exist other ways to get a secret in only the majority of secret sharing setting. I think we sort of have answered. So it's a, it's a good question and an interesting one. Uh, in our particular protocol, yes, it is necessary because we're sort of doing it in one shot. I mean, there is this last committee and the next committee and nothing in between, nothing after, nothing before. The only way for the next committee to know that, they're, um, uh, that they uh, get an actual secret sharing of the share uh, is to check the proofs. If you wanted to avoid these, uh, these proofs, there actually potentially are ways of doing that. It's not easy. Uh, there are, so you can think of all kinds of techniques, information theoretic techniques of you know, first sharing it, then opening part, and then using the other parts. These techniques don't really work out of the box in our model of with, where we need this player replaceability property, but we have some ideas that would make them work. So at least in an existential form, 
there could be solutions that will not include those proofs. This particular solution that we have in this work does require the proof. It breaks without the proofs. The adversary can cause the secret to just disappear. It can, it can uh, if, it, if the adversary, if the secret sharing committee didn't have these proofs, the adversary could have created a situation where when the uh, uh, committee wants to recover the secret, they don't have it anymore. So if you want to keep the secret, we do need these proofs in our particular solution. I see. Makes sense. Well, I think we asked you a lot of questions. Uh, just a lack of time, we are going to stop here. And uh, uh, really, thanks a lot for the exciting talk. Okay, thank you.